Welcome to My Career in Data, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Patrick Daniel at Terakeet. Visit dataversity.net and expand your knowledge with thousands of articles and blogs written by industry experts, plus free live and on-demand webinars covering the complete data management spectrum. While you're there, subscribe to the weekly newsletter so you'll never miss a beat. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp. I'm the Chief Digital Officer here at Dataversity, and this is My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management, to understand how they got there, and to talk with people who help make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Today, we are joined by Patrick Daniel, the CTO and co-founder at Terakeet. And normally, this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guest. But in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about. Patrick, hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, Thanks for joining us. I'm so excited to hear your story. So, Okay, so tell me, you are the co-founder and CTO at Terakeet. So tell me, what type of company is Terakeet? We're a connections company. We connect brands and their audience in the moments that matter. And uh, quite a while back, we realized how frustrated brands are with the amount of time and money they invest in their owned assets, their websites, their web pages, their PR and communications, and how little those assets are actually going to work for them. And so through the combination of really deep specialization across our people, Uh, Combined with the technology that we build, we pull user insights from in-market channels like search, and we use those to inform uh, what we call an an owned asset optimization strategy to bring brands to their audience directly for uh, conversations really across the user journey. And this spans organic search to exciting new emerging channels like generative AI. Oh, very, very cool. So as the co-founder and CTO, what is it you do for the company? My role uh, the last couple of years has has been more in leadership or thought leadership position where I'm helping continue to build out product teams, uh, really increase and nurture the collaboration with our delivery teams, which is where the specialization actually lives. What's unique about us is that most all of the technology we develop is used by them in-house on behalf of our brands. So we really have two sets of users. We have our customers externally that we're ultimately servicing. And then in-house, we have our teams that are helping uh, guide and influence the development of the technology we use on their behalf. So looking out for and ensuring that those spaces are safe and encouraging and we're applying practices to uh, help people converge on on their ideas and you know the the ever uh, uh, evolving challenges of reducing all the great ideas into the ones that we can do now and that will provide the most impact very nice so then how do you work with data in your current job so it's 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 become interesting um because what once was a limited set of inputs, I would say, that we could pull from the public web or from users internally uh, to begin to develop compelling tools has now, particularly with large language models being so accessible, really it's exploded. Um, But I think most, most interestingly is that what we've recognized is that with language models, the history of the work that we've done, all the great outputs, recommendations, uh, creative, which is everything from copy to media, the changes we're making to these websites, all of that is new again because it becomes the data that allows us to really contextualize language models and other technologies to bring new life to what we can provide. And that's pretty exciting when you realize that you're you're not only reliant on a go forward of continuing to use and expand some of the same inputs, but now you can harvest 
where you've been that's very proprietary to you and bring that to your customers. And that's that's highly differentiated. Oh, very, very interesting. Well, let's figure out then how you got into this. Let's back it up a little bit. So tell me, Patrick, so when you were say maybe six years old, this it just a kid, <laughs> was this the dream? Did you say, I'm gonna grow up and I'm gonna co-found and become a CTO uh, of this, of a company? Sure, I can't say that um, the awareness started then, but I got involved in this type of work at an early age, uh, 14, 15. The timing was was lucky in that, um, you know, even just prior to the commercial internet with a lot of bulletin board systems and just the concept of connecting things and building things that someone else could see and use. I played a lot of games. Uh, you could early early days of games in the in the 90s you could develop uh, your own your own environments for these games and then other people could use them and you could upload them and then in 1994 i think there were three or four hundred websites on the internet and i kind of spilled into that world of creating websites for the games that i would play and it just kind of built up over time and you know it, looking back now i can see i wasn't aware that i was continuing to pursue something that I had a deep passion for and that building things for other people was exciting to me, um, probably for far too long, um, because it's, you know, it's hard to walk away from the external pressures of what you think you should be doing or pursuing or not following a, a traditional path. You know, I didn't, I didn't go to college for computer science, um, but all the while I was learning it on my own out of necessity for the passion that I had that drove me to keep wanting to learn new things and 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 build and overcome challenges in, in building. And so um, I think it has always has always been in me. And um, now, you know, we we may operate in a particular marketing space, but the enjoyment in what I do and what I'm able to build is much more through and with the people that I'm lucky enough to have uh, at this company. And what we do is almost secondary to the fact that, you know, we're in the people business to build things and and create change in the world. And, and that's a lot of fun. Sure, sure. Well, well, tell me a little bit about that when you were a teen, you're, you're gaming, you're developing websites, you... Um... So you've got this passion, but then what are you thinking in your head? Like where and where are you going and where are you like starting to focus on your career um, as you get out of high school and, and you say you didn't major in computer science. So, you know, where did you go thinking that uh, in terms of what what was your original uh, or or where, where was your intention there for a career at that point? Yeah, I, I'd say, you know, things became more more commercial um, when we actually started the company uh, or the first iteration of Terakeet in 1999. So it's been uh, 25 years now. And uh, that was right out of high school. So we dove right in. And um, you know, interestingly, now we're in this search and information retrieval space where we help, help position brands. But in 1999, my business partner and I, uh, when it was just the two of us and, and we got started, found an opportunity among the many search engines that existed then. This is just prior to Google emerging on the scene and becoming um, more widely adopted. Uh, and spam was a real problem. So as web pages on the internet were exponentially accelerating and search engines needed to continue to crawl and index all of this information, it became very easy to outpace the quality of the algorithms and the ranking systems uh, to position something you'd like on, on the search engine where the audiences were um, and not, not get dinged for it. So a lot of bad actors emerged. And we saw an opportunity to narrow or go vertical with a search engine. And we thought, well, let's Let's move into a category that is higher consideration. You know, the values will be higher. The risk is higher. And so we chose the financial sector more broadly. And we built a search engine to just crawl financial websites. But these were sites 
at the time, uh, like the street.com, Jim Cramer's old site, uh, CBS Market Watch, and others, where there was already a built in level of trust and accreditation. And so, by only building an index for those sites, we could evade some of these spam problems. So, we created this within a year. We had an advertising model. We were off to the races. And then, of course, Google emerges with uh, their, their ever famous page rank algorithm that uh, nipped spam and, and the bad actors in the bud. And uh, uh, while, while it was still influenceable, you know, they became the general search engine um, that, you know, up until today, of course, is dominated. And so that sort of foreshadowed, though, later our understanding of discovery and cataloging and indexing of content. Uh, retrieving and, and rendering it back to users to now advise brands the same, whether it's a search aggregator or now some of these other channels um, that we're seeing rise in the mix. Oh, so fascinating. Okay, so right out of high school, you start a company. Like that is that is amazing. Uh, so what made you and your and your other co-founder say, okay, this we're just going to take a leap. We're we're young. We're we're just young and bold, and we we love what we're doing. We see this opportunity. So, like, what you know, you say you, you talk about market channels. You talk, where did you learn all that? Where did you decide uh, and go out and decide? You know how to that you had what it takes to build a business and really understand what was needed. Yeah, I think a lot of the time I had spent prior to that was in web design which became web hosting and co-location and it began i began to build systems to allow other businesses to bring information online and uh, there was always an interest in being more on the other side of it so getting out of the infrastructure and looking at how this burgeoning field was being received by you know more and more people are, were coming online um, but it was still early in, in 99 and 2000 and, uh, you know, companies were confused, didn't understand it, but knew they needed a website, regardless of whether they understood it yet, much like the same language and narratives we're hearing around AI now where everyone wants it, but maybe hasn't thought it through entirely. Well, this was the last time that happened and there haven't been too many of these. So again, it was really good timing. And um, we had an opportunity to, you know, when it's only two of you and you just have a few computers and open source programming and an internet connection, you can um, fail quite a few times without feeling the failing until you get a paying customer to start to get you cash flow to to build something, something bigger. And I think we were drawn toward uh, the idea of a more sustainable platform we could create that would have its own revenue model uh, at the time. And that's how we, we came to build the search engine. Nice. Well, tell me about getting that first customer. Like how, how did you go about that? Well, we, the, the business is headquartered in Syracuse, New York. We're very much still a part of that community. Uh, it's our background. We, we owe quite a bit of it to our, our success and still employ a significant number of people there. And so at the time, uh, we were physically in that region. Uh, I was I was in Syracuse, New York, still, and um, so it was knocking on doors, friends of friends, fit, you know, meeting business owners, people who were trying to understand the web. Um, and uh, you know, that was when being younger was almost uh, a free pass to well, they must understand it, so let's hear them out. Uh, again, it was really good timing, and so we built a lot of a lot of early websites, which then became more sophisticated systems connecting their audiences with uh, whether it's, you know, payment systems or call centers, and it, it expanded from there. But having such diversity in the early set of customers we had also kept us from remaining too narrow and going hard in one direction. And it was through that that we continued to get pulled toward the marketing side of it all, because a lot of companies were building websites, they had homes on the web, but no one was able to find them. So uh, they're not much good, good without it. And, and so we began investing more time uh, on the marketing end and figuring out how to position them for where people were starting their journey uh, online, which has, has changed significantly from the early directories and dial-in portals to search engines, to social media, uh, and and now uh, chatbots. 
With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launchpad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DVTALKS for 20% off your purchase. Very, very interesting. So tell me then, Patrick, what's been your biggest lesson so far in your career? Uh, I think I think a, a big lesson we've learned that um, in hindsight can always always seem obvious when you build a business is when you recognize the trade-offs for moving fast with a small team versus what feels like moving slow with a larger team when you're involving you know more and more people uh, we we have a mentor that that always reminds us the adage if you want to move fast go alone if you want to go far go together and um i think it isn't just about expanding the table for collaboration it's a it's a real commitment to investing in in, in people spending time with them understanding them ex explaining where you're trying to go allowing them to see your blind spots and, and point things out and it takes a really long time and it happens in cycles to be able to recognize that um, and i don't share this in a sense of having it figured out but um, i have seen many cycles of it and uh, the more that um, we allow a broader team to contribute or to iterate up on ideas, uh, the more we realize, you know, none of us are smarter than all of us. And we always usually end up in a pretty good space. So time together, getting smarter about how we spend time together through cross-functional teams versus departments, um, getting in front of customers, you know, those types of things seem to spawn the most ingenuity in the business and keep really moving us forward but it is it is very hard as an entrepreneur not to go back to your old habits of wanting to move quickly and either doing things yourselves or with a really small group of people that no one gets exposed to i can relate for sure <laughs> i've dealt with that many times throughout my career as well um it's, but uh, uh and so you but you mentioned having a mentor uh how long have you had a mentor and did you engage with mentorship right away if you guys just came across somebody who is you know for advice yeah we've had a you know we've had we've shared um my business partner and i a handful of people over the last 25 years that have been an, an exceptional fit at those times uh you know the the first probably about 10 years into our journey where there was a lot of movement in where we were spending and investing our time to help us realize that we needed to focus if we wanted to build something special. And, you know, early learnings around just the concept of, of vision and values and, and publishing things that, you know, we, when we were younger, we would read on other companies' websites and they would just seem... You know, trite and silly and not carry meaning but of course for those businesses they came out of their culture and very much hold meaning and become uh ways of of helping make decisions almost parameters um, and uh, once we realized the need for that through some of our early our early mentors uh we were able to to adjust accordingly and um so Recognizing the need for scaffolding outside your business uh, comes in a lot of different ways. It could be consultants for project-based type work. Uh, it can be long-term mentors that get to know you personally and challenge you and, you know, for us, um, keep us avoiding hard discussions. And, uh, uh, you know, it's it's it, it, it's it's been good. It's, um, yeah, it's come in, in lots of different forms. Oh, I, I always encourage and, and love hearing those kind of things. I think I wish I, you know, I mentioned it several times in this podcast. I wish I had figured out a lot earlier that it's okay to ask for help, <laughs> that you don't have to know everything and that you can't do it alone and that you have to have some guidance and, and just really, uh, it, you just learn so much uh, and uh, from, from taking those steps. 
uh, a lot of kudos to you for for how you've gone about this. So uh, tell me, so having worked with data for a while now, so what is your definition of data? I think it's I think it's our most effective tool for capturing and and preserving meaning or change with as minimal subjectivity as possible. Um, and then, of course, where humans play such a critical role is contextualizing it to draw out the insights and the stories. Uh, but, you know, raw data in, in its own right, of course, can be captured and stored and ingested in so many different ways. It's only as good as how well it can then be reinterpreted from the place of subjectivity that it originally was captured from. So it's that middle gray area uh, that I that I'd say I'd, I'd define it in. But you know, I'm I, I'm not sure there's a better way to to store it uh, or to to remove the human element um, at any point since it represents us. Uh, so then, Patrick, tell me, do you see the importance of data management and the number of jobs working with data increasing or decreasing over the next ten years, and why? Yeah, you know, I I I see it increasing. Um, I know that the popular question around AI is to get into level of threat that it poses. Uh, I think anything new or any type of change is scary and and poses a threat. The longer it goes misunderstood, but um, I think it's going to be a net positive, and it's bolstering of those types of roles because. Uh, with a lot of shifts in technology, you you typically see an, a, an unbundling of roles where we're recognizing within a given set of responsibilities an individual has, some of those tasks can be augmented by technology. And so breaking them up, I, I think needs to be embraced in favor of focusing on the areas that humans can spend more time in the same role where they likely draw more interest and passion from that only the human condition can can provide to. So with with the unbundling and with all of this change, uh, there will be no shortage of data management, data science engineering required to maintain all of these new ways to connect and interpret uh, data, particularly as we see a rise in these, these multi-agent systems, which is really more computer to computer communication occurring, uh, is just gonna create more interfaces for people as well. And so the managing all of this, making sense of it, keeping it safe, uh, improving the quality of it is going to come from those types of roles. Mm, indeed, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't disagree with that at all. Oh, Patrick, it's been fascinating to hear your story. Congratulations on the success of your company and starting uh, so young and just finding that passion so early and, and building on it. Thank you. And Thank I, you. I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, you know, if somebody wanted to learn more about Terakeet and how to solicit your services, where would they go? Our website, terakeet.com, is, uh, is, is, is the best bet for sure. Fantastic. And we'll get that posted to the um, podcast page as well. Well, Patrick, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Wonderful. I enjoyed it. Thank you, Shannon. Oh, likewise. And for all of our listeners out there, if you'd like to keep up to date in the latest in podcasts and in the latest in data management education, you may go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Until next time. Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks, a podcast brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe.